Welcome to the Elliot Hulse Podcast. Podcast. I am the king of making men strong. Shedding of the old man. Right? A way we can freely walk into rising, ascending, cleansing, sanctifying our soul for it's the Yo Elliot God. Show. God. If you're a high achieving businessman, executive, or entrepreneur who's dominating in business but struggle with drinking, drugs, overeating, or any filthy vice, here's some advice. The biggest mistake that you could make is to try to quit cold turkey and use willpower to overcome your cravings. If you've ever quit for a few days or a few weeks only to self sabotage by binging worse than before, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. Not only has my company helped thousands of men destroy vice and dominate life, I personally confronted and overcome the same struggles when I found myself hooked on weed at the peak of my business career. If you've got four minutes to listen to a coach who will help you achieve total self-mastery and control over your inner punk, then listen up. If you don't beat drinking, drugs, or any life-draining dependency in 90 days or less, not only will my company give you your money back, we'll pay for your first month's stay at a rehab retreat of your choice. That's what you need to succeed. So let's go, bro. Just visit waronvice.com fill out an application and my team will get back to you with the details. Hope to see you on the inside. Done. Yo, bros. Welcome back to the Elliot Hulse podcast. Uh, today, I have a returning guest who spoke with me on an interview I did on my channel uh, about six months ago. I would invite you to go back and look up, for, look up Arthur Kwan Lee. He's our guest for today. In that podcast, he gives you his whole background on the amazing things we're going to be talking about today. But today, we're going to dive into some deeper subjects as it relates to art in the world today, particularly how it's being used as a political weapon. Arthur, thank you for joining us, brother. Thank you for having me on, Elliot. You got it, man. Boom. Yes. Yes, sir. So it was great to have you on the show last time, man, and to, to explore your background and the things that happened to you as a conservative artist, as an as a artist who is a man first and unwilling to compromise in your values. Um, but you also gave an amazing talk at the 21 convention earlier this year. A lot of you guys remember Anthony. He's the founder of the 20, 21 convention. That talk will be coming out soon. And I invite you guys to go check that out when it happens. I'll be sure to give you an update. But I'd love to dive into some of what you spoke about in that talk because it was one of the most amazing talks I've ever heard at the convention. Um, I think the best place to begin would be to explore how art today, but dating back to the earlier, earlier part of the century, has been used as a political weapon in our world. What's that all about and how's that unfolding? So... <clears throat> Okay, I'm going to start this by speaking personally first. And the reason why all of these, uh, this culture war component in regards to the utilizing creative classes, so uh, I'm so involved in it is because I worked in the art industry for over 10 years. I worked in the New York City gallery circuit. And uh, I always noticed that there were all of the circles and the infrastructure associated with climbing up this ladder was essentially an echo chamber for a certain political ideology and a religious ideology as well. And I couldn't help but notice that, so I had to basically live in social camouflage. And eventually, because I spoke up, and at the time I was a Trump supporter, and at the time I was basically producing biblical imagery, what happened is I lost this relationship. And being castigated from these institutions forced me to really think about these things deeply. What is the roots behind this real-time experience of cancel culture? And when I delved into it, I recognized that there's a pedagogical root associated with this. And my talk was using the Nazis in particular and how they were masters of propaganda and creating ideological subversion with their creative class. That was what my talk was on. But I noticed that this was actually across all history. And I saw it from, you know, the paintings of Francisco Franco, the tyrant, uh, the cinematography of Kim Jong-il the poetry of Joseph Stalin and Mao, all of these tyrants, they understood you can utilize creative class to normalize certain values. Hmm. And that's when I was like, this is fascinating. 
And then obviously the most obvious example is the Nazis uh, with Joseph Goebbels contacting Tallinn to associate with the financial and political elite. And for me, that was like mind blowing. And, you know, I'll go further into it. They literally contacted a gentleman by the name of William Joyce. He would be like a Dave Chappelle today. Mm. That's how much influence he had as a comedian. And they secretly funded him so that he can normalize Nazi values in, in, as he did his sets on the radio. And that's brilliant because you're doing something called blending. You're seducing people by making them laugh because they the Nazis understood if you can package even demonic hatred for another artistically, the masses will normalize it for you. And that's why art is so powerful. And what I'm seeing today is modern parallels. And I look at what the radical left is doing. And I think the radical left is just a mask for the undercurrent, which is just the, the feminine matriarchal spirit. And I see what they're trying to do in the ethos. And they're like all of the rock stars today, they're essentially matriarchs. Beyonce, Ariana Grande, you see what I'm saying? It's like all of these right. figures are, are just, are just um, modern representations of Lilith. And when we watch, like, say, um, Saturday Night Live or, like, the night shows and stuff like the, the political commentators or comedians, mm -hmm. it always seems to be that there's an agenda to their speech. So are you suggesting that these so-called actors or entertainers, artists, per se, uh, are not just there to entertain but to shape the culture? All of these agents are trying to destroy Christianity. Mm. And when I say Christianity, I'll, I'll be more vague. Um, Christianity is a religion of patriarchy. So it is antithetical to feminism. So the feminine agenda is really, it, it's, again, I, I just put out a real thing. I think feminism is the largest religion in the West today. What do you mean by that? It's, it's, it's a religion. Um, the, it's goddess worship. And hmm. I believe we live under a matriarchy and... You know, the reason why Andrew Tate, for example, was a phenomena is the same reason why Donald Trump was a phenomena. Right. It's the same reason why, in many ways, you are a phenomena because you're unapologetic masculinity in a public square that demonizes any sense of a man harnessing his masculinity. Now, now obviously, some of those guys, they put it, they swing the pendulum all the way in the other direction without any balance. So there's a lack of wholesomeness. But still, the reason why they are... Uh, they're getting so much spotlight attention is because we live in, you know, what Tate calls it the matrix, but it, the matrix is essentially the matriarchy. Right. That, that's essentially what it is. Right. Yeah, we, 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 we live under the shadow of the matriarchy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where do we see uh, fruits of the matriarchy in our pop culture, you know, art, music, media? Um, where is this most uh, prevalent, prevalently seen or... Um, given to us uh, the most powerful sword in 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 this um the cast of weapons that, that the feminine spirit has is the lgbtq movement hmm. that that is, that is such a powerful sword that they have because that's the ultimate way they're gonna erase the boundaries of gender and then once that is in flux we're basically doomed right and, and look i'm not a i'm not a doomsday black pill kind of guy but there's a gentleman by the name of J.D. Unwin, and he wrote a book called Sex and Culture in 1964. This is his magnum opus. This is his life's work. And often I think about this gentleman because um, so he was a British social anthropologist in Oxford and Cambridge before it was woke. So legitimate brainy guy. Yeah. And he studied 86 different cultures recorded through 5,000 years of history. And he noted that what the Sumerians, the Babylonians, the Athenians, the Romans, what they all had in common were they were all the superpower of its time and they were patriarchal. And then once they transitioned to matriarchies, every single one fell. Where do we see uh, in those cultures maybe some examples of that transition from uh, a male-led patriarchal order to, you know, what some might say... Uh, the feminist disorder that we're, you know, that the, the fall of it, those it, 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 empires it's, it's experienced. Actually, and this is, the, this is the scary thing because it's cyclical. Um, once, there's really three sigils of a society at doom. There's three warnings. 
their first warning is um, widespread atheism. And obviously, today we look at Nietzsche's gay science when he wrote God is Dead. Jordan Peterson has proliferated that notion and normalized it, which is good. Uh, so the first sign is the death of God. The second sign of a society towards its doom is female sexual liberation. And that's what Unrin writes in Sex and Culture. And then the final sign is what Roger Scruton talks about, the desecration of beauty and rewriting of history. So we're at the last stage. So, so it's, it's disconcerting, but but when you read guys like Yuri Bezmenov, right. when you read guys like J.D. Unwin, Scruton, um, all of these people who are so predictive were basically right on track. You know, Is this a inborn archetype of the human experience, or is this something that is uh, unleashed as a weapon to destroy? Beginning with the first stage, which is uh, the death of God. Mm -hmm. I, I <laughs> uh, see. This is this is the trouble I have because is it just a part of the human condition? Is it inevitable? Because it seems that every one of these societies has fallen, and and there's always this large contingent of strong men like you, like myself, who speak up, but it's never enough. Right. And, and, and I mean, look, if I saw. The circling of the drain and the unraveling, I'm still going to go down fighting for my own integrity right. right? as a man. But that said, it's once again, um, it's it denigrates uh, quite a bit of the, the spirit that we're coming from because every single one of these empires were not able to reverse the process. And once once you liberate women sexually um, within three generations, no, basically, no society is able to be sexually liberated whilst having this expansive energy to build socially cohesive, uh, social cohesion upwards. No society can do both. And that's what his evidence showed. Um, he, he saw a positive correlation between a society's sexual restraint and their ability to build towards uh, upwards with civilizational means. And, and it's, it's concerning because we're so, we're in such a lascivious point of our culture that it's like trying to get 160 million women to go back in the kitchen right right <laughs> yeah or trying to undo the fall in the garden yeah would you say that this is something that stems well we could say the human condition or the fallen human condition as a result to uh, uh, of our ancestors decisions uh particularly that of well first adam to uh be derelict in his duty to protecting and covering his wife and then his wife stepping out from underneath his authority and then being in cahoots with Satan. It almost seems like the same pattern. Well, well you know, Eve um, is able to, you know, recover herself by, by being a mother though. You see, that's kind of the idea. Like she, but you know, again, there's, there's, I talk about this notion of Lilith mm. and I'm really interested in this because there is, a pagan and witchcraft oriented spirit behind feminism. And if you look at this uh, pagan feminist culture, they're always worshiping this goddess Lilith. And Lilith is literally the, the shadow form of Eve. And she's supposed to be looked upon as like cool as well. We and have she's like, like the Lilith bad girl. Fair. Yeah, she's like the bad girl. And she's like a pop you know? culture icon in many ways. Today. Yes, yes, but people don't realize like Lilith actually demanded the slaughtering of babies over the water. Like all of these th these uh, demonic manifestations that reminds me of Planned Parenthood, actually. <laughs> right, it sounds uh, you know? very reminiscent or like indicative of what's going on today. Yeah, I, I think we live under the shadow of the dark feminine. Hmm. Yeah. And so as an artist... Uh, you encountered this first in your line of work. Uh, talk to us about, well, in the 20th century, where we began to see this manifestation of the dark feminine in the, well, what you call the degradation of art. How does art, how has art changed and how has it been a change agent to uh, manipulate the culture or change the culture? So uh, there's a gentleman by the name of Tom Wolf, and he wrote this book called The Painted Word. And his whole thing was he was a lover of art, a New Yorker, and he was obsessed with how people can represent high culture, essentially. 
And what he came to see is that um, this postmodern agenda in conjunction to the, to the feminist agenda, essentially, they are they want to destroy actual aesthetic standards and they're promoting relativism, essentially. Hmm. So the first thing I'll say is aesthetically speaking, when you go into galleries today, the standard of art has gone down. That's why anyone here listening has gone to, you know, the modern art museum section or galleries and have thought, what is this? Right. Like, what what am I looking at? Well, that's a natural, like, that's totally organic and that's justified. That's a righteous feeling because the reality is, what are you looking at? Most of the time, this art is horse manure. But the reason why it's, it's, it's um, they've brought down the standard of art to a field of relativity. And when the patriarchy was in charge, art, the creative class was utilized to uphold universal standards, ideally towards something spiritual, right? That's why the greatest artists have always been um, Christian in that regard for a reason. Right. Because they're sort of utilizing their talent towards servitude. And you're almost, again, well, you remember when I mentioned Unwin? Mm -hmm. And now what we're talking about here? All energy that builds upwards, it's always, what I've been noticing is that energy has a shape. And, and we talk about, you know, I don't, I don't mean what energy can be, electric, nuclear. That's, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about how all energy in order to build needs to either folk, localize and build upwards or you leave it to chaos. Right. And, and it, it's this interesting thing where it's either here in the mud or you're building it up. Right. It's like integration or disintegration. Yes. Yeah, th th this is what you do. You focalize and, and then you build upwards or you leave it to its chaos. This is what every type of energy, whether nuclear, spiritual material, this is what I've been noticing as well. There's, a, there's an analogous shape. And I've seen this visually manifest in actual paintings and sculpture as well, where it's either this miasmic crap or it's a standard that is based on pointing towards something higher are you suggesting that art is subject or objectively beautiful or as some people believe art is subjective beauty is not in the eye of the beholder we all know ah. this but, but, what, <laughs> but but we but we like to uh masquerade and pretend like that is the case because otherwise you know we, we you know these modern npcs have to see how overweight they are or they need to recognize that this man here is intimidating or they need to look in a mirror essentially and, and mm. instead of looking at themselves they'd rather just say everything is a clean flat rock <laughs> yeah. that's, basically I'm the okay, you're that's okay. the strategy yeah it's, it's just more collectivism and um look i i need to make something very clear though um i'm not blaming women right this is a very important point because people don't hear the balance and I want to approach this holistically. I know I, I'm talking about the dark manifestation of the feminine psyche, but I'm not blaming women. Right. I'm saying it's the absence of masculinity. Right. It's nuanced here. I'm not saying it's woman's Would fault. Would you go it's, as yeah. far even as to say that it has been man's dereliction that has led to the female uh, usurpation? It, 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 it is man's fault. It is, it is man's fault. Yeah. I, I think it's, all, it's always on men, actually. And it, it's difficult for me to have this conversation with red pill people sometimes because um, there is a streak of bitterness where it's almost like, well, we need to put it on the woman where I'm right. like, I'm like, I agree if they want, if they're coming at you with their fangs, I can see your point, right? Cause you, uh, this preservation. Okay. I can understand that argument, but ultimately um, it's the, the real problem are the real problem today is that weak, cowardly, malicious men outnumber strong men. It's a numbers thing. That, like, that's really the problem. Like, numbers is a reality. Hmm. Like, there's just so many white knights and spineless men who can be controlled by, by female sexuality. There's just there's such a large contingent here that outnumbers. Like, for, for every one Elliot Hulse, there's maybe 10,000 <laughs> <laughs> cowardly... Um, pussy whipped drones. You see what I'm saying? Right. And, and the problem is that we're just so outnumbered. So like, I actually think these men are the problem. These men are the ones validating and the muscle behind women. Cause at the end of the day, everything is based on war and God. Everything is based at the baseline level. It's all war and your religion. Right. And they have their warriors for them. 
The feminine psyche is only effective. A feminist society, which is what we're pushing, only exists on the tail end of its of its run. You know, so it's an oxymoron because they can't exist. They don't have muscle. They have no power behind them, but they do weak men. Right. So the real problem is weak men. I don't I don't even care. Like, honestly, like maybe I look even more like a sexist, but I don't even waste my time talking to women. Well, even beyond that. So you mentioned the three stages beginning with atheism. Would you say that um, atheists are weak men and it is from that paradigm that there is no authority in God the Father? that uh that leads them to be susceptible well, well i mean i'll first say that atheism has already lost mm. but we have to understand it's not because um it's not like sam harris and jordan peterson sitting at this table having a disagreement and then one person comes up at the top it's more that atheism um it just collectively has not satisfied satisfied the masses at all and it Basically, materialism cannot answer spiritual questions. That's all it boils down to. So athe right. atheism is already done, by the way. The real problem, because atheism is now past its torch to, as I said, atheism's cousin, which is Lilith, feminism. Right. Christianity is not about defeating atheism. It's about Christianity defeating feminism. Right, because then that is the religion that replaces yes. Christianity. Yes. Atheism has passed the torch to feminism. Right, because atheism cannot fulfill, but... Perhaps feminism fulfills a in, in, in a in a perverted way a, a sense of needing some sort of existential guide. Uh, and therefore, Lilith and feminism. See, people aren't cognizant of any of these feminist archetypes. They're possessed by them. Mm. They're, they're not even aware. This is what How I do mean. You mean. Tell me more. You can look at any. Um, Okay, so so my my friend and I were just talking about this. How like, you know, when we when we went to college, um, there was literally like a large group of men that we just felt bad for because, uh, long story short, because we went to college together, and every time like we we were at some kind of social gathering, if a beautiful woman comes in, there's always a contingent of men who are just ready to bow down right. and do whatever they like. Uh, I'm possessed. Check this out. <laughs> this is what I'm saying. It's like the reason why I like using the spiritual language magical language is because it makes you experience it and feminists are witches and their sexuality is a spell i mean how powerful is female sexuality as a tool as a weapon it's incredibly powerful i mean every guy here can think about how some girl that just gave them the correct gaze bothers them and they can't even sleep like every man can relate mm -hmm. with that to a degree you right. see what i'm saying because it's a spell you are under a seance and Would you say that this is what you mean by sexual, well, quote unquote, liberation? Yeah, I, I mean, because uh, when when female sexuality is left unchecked, it leaves the men, the, the men no longer care about fighting for their culture. Honor. Yeah, th th there's, there's no point because um, it's very interesting, but the way it works out is that when a man doesn't, uh, when, when a man when a man lives in a culture that's social institutions forbids uh, compulsory instincts and and desires, what happens is he has this tension in him, and that emotional conflict actually is useful for building a civ civilization, and that's what gets castigated. That's what that that's the thing that conflict that fight you have to not masturbate. Or to not look up pornography, that's directly connected to your creative ability. And it's it's wild because this should be taught in sex ed. They right. should be reading Unwin and R versus K selection. They shouldn't be learning about, you know, female reproductive organs. They should be reading JD Unwin and R versus K selection. Because then you have practical information about imprinting and how to build a society and how sex is an undercurrent um, force in conjunction to a higher religious order. I can't help but to think of that line, there's no honor amongst thieves. And it sounds like, you know, it's what it's honor that is discarded as a result of men now being thieves in that they're receiving things that don't belong to them in the promiscuity of quote unquote sexual liberation, uh, you know, sterile, transient sex. Yeah. And so by uh, having contraception, you know, which is a very 
hot topics. You know, yeah. you start talking about contraception, people don't understand why it's a sin, but then it uh, subjects men to this uh, almost uh, entitlement, like somehow they're entitled to be receiving sex from women. It, and, and it allows them, it, it allows the witchcraft to proliferate. They're able to basically control men even stronger. Their spells are stronger now that they can just go on birth control and actually fuck these men and completely have them entranced. It just makes your spell stronger. It's crazy because, yeah. you know, years passed, or at least maybe the, the the story was that women were the ones that were being ravaged by sex and that they were being taken advantage of. But I can't help but to see amongst the men that I deal with and speak to and mentor that it's really the men that are getting kicked to the side and that are being yeah. taken advantage of uh, because of unrestrained sexuality, not the women. Yeah, you, you know... Um... This is something that's controversial to the red pill as well, but, you know, free love, it, I believe it's worse for men. Yeah, I agree. I believe it's worse for men. And and, and every time I say this, like I'll, I, some of my red pill fans will be like, like, what are you talking about? I hear you because a woman's value is connected to her purity in youth. I hear you, especially as an investment. Fair. But my point is, a man's ability to stand up for what's right is literally sucked out of him. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know? Right. And, 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 and it's, it's, um, it, it's I, like I can tell you personally, I don't, I don't masturbate. And I, I retain my seed. And you, you can look at my art. It'll speak for itself. You know? So <laughs> men of the, say, Middle Ages or Renaissance era, you know, uh, Michelangelo, I think you did something about him recently, Leonardo da Vinci, uh, these were men of a patriarchal order. These were men that lived in a time when there was sexual purity and it was highly reverenced. Um, are we seeing the degradation of art as a result of sexual liberation? Yes, yes, 100%. Um, Look, it's, look, look! I'm not a, I'm not a Freudian. Sex isn't everything, okay? It's, it's not like we're just baseline. It's all about sexual control, um, but sex is supposed to live under the order of a religious order. That that's that's my point. And uh, I I, th I think that oh my gosh, like if, if it it sounds so crazy, but because of the promiscuous nature of females today everything is going to fall apart. Right. You know, so, but again, and I blame the men for that, but I think that unfortunately, look, if there was a button here, right? Like a nuclear bomb button and I push this button and it gets rid of welfare and abortion and marriage through the government and everyone has to marry through a church, I would push it right now. And there'll be so much collateral damage, but it would work right within two and a half generations or three. I'd push it right now. Right. But I, but but because I don't have that button, what's going to have to happen instead if you're going to if you're going to look at it, clearly what's going to happen instead is we're going to have a generational wall that a lot of women are going to hit soon and feel a collective regret. Right. And it's going to be so heavy you'll feel it in the air. Right. Like it's going to be like when you go into a butcher shop or or, or a slaughterhouse. There's no animals there but you can feel the, the, the death of so many animals. I'm using that as an example because I once experienced that. Um, but it's, you're going to feel it in the psyche. The women are just going to have this collective misery. And all these women are going to realize that they're fornicating freely. <laughs> mm -hmm. And now they're um, discarded and they're what they call leftover women. Right. So you mentioned these three stages. I'm really fascinated with that. So the death of God, uh, it's very evident uh, in our world today. Uh, during the riots of 2020, we watched as statues were torn down, um, brilliant, beautiful pieces of art that represent order and tradition. Um, and now we're watching all kinds of, well, ugly art being placed all demonic. over. Demonic. Right. Well, right, demonic. okay. Speak yeah. to that. What's going on there? Is there a, a change of guard here happening that we're seeing? Yeah, there, there's uh, this, the terminology is satanic inversion. It's hmm. very, very important to know this word. Um, everything we're seeing is uh, being flipped upside down, essentially, you know, which is why, you know, we've heard things like uh, fat is beautiful. You know, men can be women. Everything is being reversed, essentially. Right. 
And and in the Christian order, you know, um, it's funny be, because I can talk about Christian order from a, a personal standpoint, but I like to talk about it from more of a bird's eye view, strategic building a society sort of angle because it's it's useful in that way. And when I look at it here, the the power of the church and Christian thinking and, and Christian fathers is that essentially it was creating a model that allowed the optimal family structure to maintain and protect and provision. That's essentially what the structure is attempting to do. Um, and by by knocking down these colonial figures, it's it's now they've knocked down some Christian statues as well, but it's been predominantly Western men figures, mm -hmm. uh, white men in particular. Mm -hmm. But but the idea is is kind of the same. They're trying to just get rid of any patriarchal sigil, you know, because you can knock this down. And you can say that, I mean, that's that is as Hollywood as it gets. You're literally knocking down a public representation of values and putting up yours instead. Right. And that's what we see happening. Even it's, the, you know, the burning of Notre Dame and this antithesis towards Mary, the mother of God, that we've seen unfolding for the past 500 years. Mm. I would venture to say, I wonder if you agree, that that is attack on femininity uh, at its, you know, most vicious. You know, there's a lot yeah. of hatred towards, you mentioned these colonial figures, but the uh, desecration of uh, the statues of Virgin Most Powerful, you know, the most yeah. uh, pure and perfect woman to ever walk this planet also is uh, probably the pinnacle of this sense of hatred towards purity and order. Yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's um, I think anything traditional, but there's a, there's a deeper word for that. Anything that points towards the logos is being taken down. Anything that points towards a universal truth that is ultimately good for the family is being taken down. And, and, and that's, it's always about destroying the family, right? Mm. So, so, so all of these, all of these images, paintings and sculptures being destroyed, um, they're just, they're just trying to get rid of the family essentially, you know? Um, and I think under all of this, it's the spirit of, it's a spirit of paganism and Christianity fighting. That is what we're seeing. Those are the two impulses. And I'm not a Buddhist, but I'll use a yin and yang example. It's like, it's almost like those two energies are fighting. And, and new age thinking will, will tell you that like, yeah, well, we need the bad people for that reason. I'm like, no, 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 no. That's an important conceptual lesson, sure. But the way in practice society should be run is we can't have any of that. <laughs> yeah, I agree <laughs> in, with in you. In practice, right. yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Boundaries. Yes, boundaries. And and I, But I do see this impulse between this pagan spirit to destroy any sense of a higher order and God the Father. And it is a father. That's the important thing. It's it's not it's not God the mother. Let's make that clear. And that's another problem I see with a lot of these churches today. <laughs> a woman. A woman. Yeah. It's 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 um that is foolish. And why is that? What what would you say to somebody that argues? Well, you know, women are equal to men, and uh, and perhaps women have been treated poorly for so long, and it's high time they would say that <laughs> women take their place uh, in this way. What's wrong see, with see, that? I'll tell you. So if, I, if there's a girl listening to this show who's on the fence, who is in a university where her feminist leftist professors are trying to pull her one way, and on the other hand, uh, she looks at the, uh, her mother and father in, 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 in a romantic, appreciative way. If there's a woman listening to this dilemma, I will say that, like, assuming this person actually has open ears, you're getting equality and identicality confused. Because a woman who actually, like a man who sees a woman in her femininity proper, that is a powerful woman, mm -hmm. actual power. Mm -hmm. see, see, a woman's power is not through, through uh, how much, look, they can lift, obviously. Right. right? A woman's power is her ability to, to make things lighter, ability uh. to bring in, <laughs> bring in a gust of wind behind your actual walk. It, it's a supportive force, but it is a legitimate power. And- Ideally, that sexual power as well 
is preserved under her man because then it's not a sin you know because that because it's it's between two people um and that there's a holiness to that you know and, and it, it's actually like very it it it, it just fits it clicks so well a mm -hmm. woman can be um you can ravage a woman if she's yours properly right that's what i'm saying and it's not and and the evil is out of there in that case as well it's almost as primal at that point but it's, right but it's but it's but it's, it's rightly it's, but there's ordered. adoration too you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. but it's it's like we're kind of missing that whole um it, it's all out of whack now and again I, i'm sex free sex a, any any sexual act that is not walking towards building a family is a stain to the soul. That's what I'll say. Yeah. And so there's such a big pop culture push for the sentiments that you're that you're uh, suggesting. Uh, the music, the movies. We see it in Hollywood. Um, universities. I mean, it pervades the culture uh, so much so mm. that would you agree that most people are under this spell and they don't even know that it exists. They are totally bamboozled, Elliot. They don't even know that they're possessed by the spirit. They're, 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 they're you know, there's a term that a lot of young people who are based have been using, which is NPCs. Mm. They're literal NPCs. They're non-playing characters. You know, I'm not a video game guy, but the idea is that like, you know, there's, you're, you're, there's you playing the game and then there's right. just empty space you know right. these people who are walking around most people are npcs most people are just echoing sentiments that they heard that their uh collective around them is telling them to push forward uh, most people don't actually think critically and and think about what builds a society you know what keeps things in order and it is the spirit of the benevolent wise king we need that spirit um and, and that is what's basically missing. And, and and I'll tell you that our culture is always going to be, until we can openly speak out about this and, and, and more, I would say more larger figures can start having the gonads to also speak up as well and deal with the cancellation. And we can continue supporting this direction of people basically sticking the finger to the, to the feminized state. Um, it's always going to be an undercurrent. It's always like the masculine force will always be essentially fetishized until we can put it to the forefront because you're putting it underground. So it's going to manifest in a different fashion. And I think we talked about this last time and that's the whole attraction and alert to hip hop, for example. Hip hop culture is is overcompensating masculinity. And, and, and I enjoy hip hop when I work out and all these things, too. Mm -hmm. I enjoy what kind of hip hop. Because there's, I, uh, I, I enjoy a lot. You know, of, a lot of these guys are wearing dresses. And... Well, I don't know. Enjoy that hip hop. <laughs> <laughs> but but no, I mean I appreciate hip hop because. But what I appreciate about it is that it's so masculine. You know what I mean? It's right. Like, even if they're cursing, like that's why people like hip hop. This is my point. There's an undercurrent of masculinity there, mm -hmm. but it's always going to be an undercurrent of a aggressive, overcompensated form of masculinity until we put up masculinity into into the spotlight well, it's a rebellious honor. it is a rebellious form of masculinity, masculinity. Yeah. but that is the attraction hip-hop and donald trump and tate they all have the same thing in common would you say that rebellion and order are antithesis to each other i think rebellion is order under the table not always but 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 it can. You see what I'm saying? What do you saying? mean? No. What do you mean by that? Okay. Okay. Like, let's look at a a, a positive form of masculinity in culture. Uh, Braveheart. The film Braveheart. Okay, that's an artistic represent representation of masculinity in a positive way, right? Done properly. So we have Braveheart here. Now let's say all of this is looked at upon as patriarchal, and demonized by the matriarchy. Well, it's going to be put underground. Now we have things like gangster rap and all these things under the table. Does that make right. sense? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, it's not for virtue. It's a rebellion. So you're suggest suggesting that Braveheart is a rebellion towards virtue, where perhaps like hip hop, where, you know, the rebellion is using swear words. I would say and Braveheart isn't even, re I mean, okay, art, artistic expressions of masculinity in like such a positive light that, that is uh, good for the world, that's not a rebellion. That's just saying, like, that's just the truth. 
You know, that's just an archetypal truth. This is this is a necessary part of culture. And I would say um, the shadow form is all these artistic expressions that are that are basically not good for the world, but they're catchy and they're fun and 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 um that's the attraction to them. But it's it's just like it's like the shadow of of it's a shadow of masculinity, you know, but it still is a form of masculinity, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, shadow masculinity. Yeah. So let's talk about uh, order for a moment and, and Western culture. We both agree that uh, the greatest of Western art came from Catholics, mm-hmm. the Catholic order. Yep. Um, I'm under the uh, belief, I believe, that a lot of this breakdown that has led to uh, feminism uh, began with the protestism of the uh, 14th, 15th century with Martin Luther and the splitting up of Christ's church and that, uh, that Protestantism is in a way, um, le- has led to where we are right now because it is a, uh, a, a rejection of the order that gave us the beauty that built our civilization. Mm. Mm. Yeah, there, there's a lot of infighting in these denominations, we'll call it, right? Um, mm-hmm. And, and um, yeah, I, I often say that the first person in the Bible who is filled with the Holy Spirit is one of the first people. is a gentleman by the name of Bezalel and his assistant Oholiab in Exodus. And they're both artists. They were sculptors. And it's very clear that Bezalel makes it very clear that the ultimate fun- function of an artist is spiritual servitude. That is where your art is at its strongest because you're pointing upwards. Your art has a North Star that is beyond your primal urges or narcissism or worshiping of self. And that's why he created the tabernacle, right? And, and, and all of this is like literally like that, that to me says it all from a biblical context but well, what do you it, say to Protestants who suggest that the creation of statues is, uh, is idol worship. idolatry when yeah. we know the uh, the Ark of the Covenant was uh, commissioned by God? You know, I, I had so many people lambasting me when I painted Christ Pantocrator. I painted this, this right. depiction of Christ. The, it seems to me that yeah. in Protestantism, there is a iconoclasm. Uh, the churches are modernist typically looking they don't look like the notre dame or like the great cathedrals of europe um i think i think it's leaning i think it's a it's a a lens towards the rebellion that we're experiencing today (laughs) absolutely because you got to understand that and the ugliness in art you know doug wilson once said that you can't talk about christian culture if you're not um into christian culture so you're saying that i cannot depict christ in this very oblique masculine warrior spirit that has been done for, for, um, I don't know the exact timeline, but it's been done over and over again. This notion of Christ Pantocrator, just Google it. It's a warrior yeah. Christ. By the right? way, your rendition of it is amazing. It's, it's savage. Beautiful. In it's your savage. in your style, <laughs> your red style, man, amazing. Oh, thank you, brother. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'll I'll tell you the first thing. If we're not going to grab the bull by the horns, then the enemy will. And I guess what I'm saying is that, um. If we're going to talk about this from a biblical language in regards to evangelizing and bringing people to the light, you know, keep in mind influence is a part of that equation. Right. And notice what the Enlightenment did is when this Protestant notion of stop depicting these people as false idols. Well, number one, the artists are not expecting people to worship the paintings. Right. <laughs> they're just <laughs> they're, right. nobody worships no, statues no, or paintings. Yeah, no one's expecting that. But but the next step of that because I get this all the time. Because I paint biblical imagery out of inspiration, but they think it's blasphemous, right? And it's so strange because the intention right. is not. Well, it's that a rebellious at all. idea because when you're not under the authority of the church, you start taking the words of the church, the Bible, yeah. out of context and making up your own ideas, which is you know. Yeah, a yeah form it, of it, it just feminism. reads to me a person who is not actually grounded in the word or or, or oriented towards the church or tradition. In the first place. Or tradition. Tradition is lack basically of, lack thrown of away. Lack of reverence, and I'll say that the Enlightenment, they literally use that against us because the good men of the good talented men were told not to do such you know they were told not to create so enlightenment depicted christ as this liberal hippie going forward that's why you have all of these you won't go into some some dollar store and see this little gold cheap gold frame of of christ the lamb looks like this hippie petting the lamb yeah. when 
he should actually have uh, a whip. <laughs> and, mm-hmm. and, and if we're going to be biblically accurate, this was a strong man who, right. who had a lot of love. So he can not. He can also have a hand out to the full to help men to be strong like him, so they can be sources of light in the world. See that that's that's also strategically brilliant, and I think that's just lacking because we're not in the culture, man. Mm-hmm. So so it's like I you know I mean it's kind of like you know you're you're basically saying we're not gonna um we're gonna we're gonna talk about culture and be all uh, erudite. And theoretical here, but then we can actually participate in the front. No art, no films, no beauty, no writing, nothing. Yep. So it's just the true and the good, not the beautiful. Right. <laughs> it right. doesn't make sense to me. So yeah. How do you you you've mentioned to me that you are a Christian anarchist? Yes. How do you reconcile you know this traditional conservative uh, leaning that you have, or, or you're even a, a soldier for this, a warrior for it, with the idea of anarchism? Well, I mean, essentially, I I just hate the government, <laughs> and, and, and 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 I couldn't help but see that the uh, in the when when again the, the claim of when Nietzsche said God is there, we've we've mentioned this many times on this podcast now. But the reason why I'm mentioning it once again is because that vacuum, that 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 longing for higher order, all went to the state. So, right. So the government exploded once people became atheists, and also statistically, most atheists they vote. For a larger state, and right. uh, they vote in welfare like women often, and and it's because they need they're still longing for a higher order to sort of right. take care of things. So they're gonna be meta and say, "Daddy government" instead of "Daddy sky," I guess. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and and that's kind yeah, of the what logos, I, the yeah, the, the, or, the ordering principle of the universe. Yeah. So so I mean, again, it's funny because first thing I have to do is when I say anarchist, people think of dystopian chaos. You know Heath Ledger, uh, cops cars burning around and all this. Yeah. No, um, it's <laughs> it's it's not. I'm not saying we should have no authority. That wouldn't make sense because I'm a Christian, right? Mm-hmm. I believe in a higher authority. I'm submitted to that. That wouldn't make sense. Yeah. I'm saying I want to eviscerate the government as much as possible, and like I'll still vote right if it if it comes down to it because that's less state. Then, <laughs> then the mm-hmm. left uh, it's closer to it but um you know it's it's i just there's enough of a pattern for me to see that when you give the government power they they treat you as peons and i believe that you know the larger the government the less influence the church has on its people as well i've also noticed that because my father is a pastor mm-hmm. and i've also noticed that so if you actually want masculine authentic patriarchal pastors well notice that a lot of those guys we can talk about michael foster we can talk about um wh- whatever ministers you have in mind he's just he, uh, none of these people stay away from <laughs> they base their found they their foundations of the actual churches are away from government reach right for a reason because right. they want to get away from that so they can actually help the people accordingly and and I just couldn't help but notice that the more the government intervenes in people's lives, the 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 further they have trust in their religious order. The women become more um, expected of resources without being properly in their place. The men become lazier. Um, yeah, the government is is a handout essentially, right? And I and I just can't get behind that. Um, I'm pleased to. Heard I think Christ you- would have been an anarchist too. Because the state is the one who crucified him, by the way. <laughs> hmm. He also <laughs> held up that coin and said, render to Caesar what is his. In other words, hmm. let them yeah. be. Um, hmm. And he's the king of a different order altogether. He says his kingdom is not even of this world. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. But I, I guess what I'm saying is, you know, because this is an important point, because I see this between Christians all the time. Followers of Christ are always saying, this is not my world. Yeah. So and I'm like I agree, mm-hmm. but we still have dominion over it. We should Absolutely. still we should still be putting out our message out publicly because otherwise people will suffer more and be more disconnected towards the truth. You spoke about the Enlightenment earlier, and I'm I you know pleased to hear your position on it. Um, I refer to it as the Endarkenment, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. but a lot of people are not familiar with why that would be given our public school textbooks and what we've been taught and even the term enlightenment 
Um, how is it or why is it that the Enlightenment has been uh, a negative force in our world today? It, it basically recalibrated all of these important rituals and institutions towards the self. Mm. It became about worshiping of the self. And, you know, we, you know, uh, on one hand, I say men have to care more about themselves, you know, because look at how out of shape people are. Look at how lazy people are. Look at how they're not standing up for what's right. They're, right. they're allowing themselves to be drones mm -hmm. on one hand. But um, that will get dull. And if you have any perspicacity to you, you're going to also understand that that should be oriented towards something deeper if you want to have a fulfilling, meaningful life. So I, I think we're, we're in a way we're still in the shadow of the enlightenment. It's funny that you oh, say yeah. light. Um, mm -hmm. But but they're always rebranding. Uh, yeah, I, I it's funny because I had this crazy conversation at the cigar lounge with uh, this this professor of theology, and he just he, he was just telling me enlightenment has ruined everything. All the problems in the Christian church today, the feminization of the church, is all because of the enlightenment. And when often when I think about the most masculine, and I would actually say I hate using the word toxic, but in a toxic form today is Islam, right? But Islam keeps their women clothed. Islam keeps their women chaste. Islam cannot coexist with feminism. They will kill it. Islam is not afraid to die. Islam has no special interest outside of all the money they have so they can build beautiful art. I mean, Islam is doing it right in regards to Unwin's diagnosis of expansive energy, right? Now, Christianity had that same structure, but it was much deeper. When, it, when you look at Christianity and Islam side by side, Christianity is way deeper. But the Enlightenment has perverted quite a bit of the audience. Right. So that's why we need to sort of um, cut ties with that, that shape that's attached to it. It's, it's like a tumor almost. And we have to cut it off so we can mm -hmm. get back on track. And, you know, I'm not saying we have to go on the Crusades, but we have to kind of... <laughs> no way. Annie up, Annie up, you know, mm -hmm. an ideological crusade. Why not? And, right. and, and you know, and, and that sounds extreme, but it's not any more extreme than what they're doing. You know, who would you say was behind this subversion, beginning with the Enlightenment, and then ultimately all of the quote unquote revolutions that we see today? I mean, look, if I'm going to get deep to the point, I would say the devil. You know, mm -hmm. I, I believe it is the devil. And I are there the devil is a actors force. who he's acting through in yeah, this yeah. world? Yeah, the, the original, the original, I guess, one who bit the apple was Plato. Hmm. Yeah. And I would say all of this, all of this... Um, Counter Christian thinking, right? They're all students of Plato in a way, and I'm not. And look, Plato did a lot of great things. I'm not. Well, I'm not, Plato was before Christ. Yeah, yeah, so but, but 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 I'm but I'm saying this this the philosophy that he's coming from is essentially a philosophy of materialism, and and, and if he if he's a root, if he's a founding father of philosophy, um. And then the devil will always use materialism to seduce human beings. Mm. Uh, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm speaking very philosophically here, mm -hmm. but he <laughs> might be one of the originators of the devil's doing because if people want to be intellectual to defend their ideas, they get very platonic. You know, they get very platonic and they use material arguments to try to dismantle a spiritual point. Hmm. And, and that's why, you know, his whole... this. Th that's that's I don't know I, I if I'm gonna blame specific people, there's a lot of people to blame, right? But mm -hmm. um, I I just recognize that it all comes from this worshiping of the self through materialism. That is what I believe is the problem, and it's it's just so hard to bring it back in. But yeah, 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 and, and that's that's a challenge I've been really having, and I'm starting to think that we need to kind of. I need, we just need a we need a mean streak because we're just playing nice with these guys, and they're just laughing at us. A counter order. Yeah, some something where because we because there is an order. Or what are your thoughts on Freemasonry? 
I need to do more research on that. You can enlighten me now. Enlighten. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, it was just a question. Mm -hmm. uh, I would need to do more, but at the same time, sworn enemies yeah. of the church against cross and crown uh, is there a rallying right. call. And the mm. subversion of Catholicism in particular, there's no question that the church has been subverted and Satan's smoke has been in the church for at least the past 100 years. Uh, their goal was to put their man in the papacy, which some argue has been for at least the past 60, 70 years. Mm -hmm. um, and then also in cahoots with those who Hitler <laughs> rallied against. Yeah, the Jews, yes. Right. Uh, the forbidden word. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Have worked to subvert the entire culture as yeah. a result, because as uh, mm. I think Augustine says, as I don't know if it was Augustine, but uh, as goes the church, goes the society. You're right. Against right. cross and crown, right. against order and logos. And so, you know, here we have now, uh, you know, guys like, uh, who's that basketball player that everybody loves? LeBron James, you LeBron. know, yeah. throwing up like uh, Satan signs before every basketball game. And, you know, these uh, rap music uh, guys who are like putting blood on their shoes yeah, and yeah. selling them and Lil it Nas seems X. to have gone completely towards the the satanic in every regard well well what i'll say is everything we're talking about here whether it's sex art religion culture essentially what it is what we're denoting is that human beings are very disconnected with the spirit so they will be de facto circumstantial mm. when you're disconnected to a higher truth you will be a, a absolute product of your circumstances so this idea of determinism, it exists for those who are not conscious, you right. know? And, and the reason why I say this is that when I said that there, there was a button here that can cut off welfare and abortion and all these things, well, women would act accordingly within a couple of generations because they have nothing else to lean onto. You see what I'm getting at? Right. And in the same manner, we need better infrastructure. We need galleries putting up God-fearing art. We need churches to stand up for what's right and talk about vaccines and hypergamy and all these issues that the left is, you know, perverting so effectively. We need, we need our institutions to be stronger because they're the ones disseminating these values with the people. So I, I just believe people are so circumstantial mm -hmm. uh, because they're not actually looking at themselves with the information at hand. These are very hard structures, institutions you talk about. You are of a subtle, art is subtle. Mm -hmm. And so I'd like to circle back to that because it seems even more than the institutions is the cultural war. You know, Antonio Gramsci said that mm -hmm. the West won't be won through bombs and bullets. These are yeah. hard things, but by a cultural Marxism, mm -hmm. a, uh, a subversion, an ideological subversion. And uh, you are a warrior against the uh, the use of subtle means, subtle weapons, mm -hmm. uh, the art. What do you imagine or suggest or just, you know, open up the conversation about a return to traditional art, masculine art, art that represents the logos, art that that changes the hearts and minds uh, and and elevates people rather than debases them yes. through the music and through the movies and through the galleries and things of this nature? What do we need more of in order to come back to this place? Because art is spiritual. Yeah. And so that's really where the battle is. I would, I would venture to say more so than the government order, even the ecclesial orders, the mm -hmm. church. Mm -hmm. I think it's the hearts and it's the minds. And so it's well, the well, music well, well, and we the are, movies. Um, um, you know, there's this idea that art limit imitates life, uh, but I believe it's more correct to say that life imitates art. I am with you 100%. Yes, yes. We need to create, we need more creators, but I will tell you that we live in an attention market today. Mm -hmm. So we need to get these people who are morally in line with our values getting attention and keeping them in line so they don't get corrupted. We need talent that's creating fantastic art in that regard. And that's, 
again, what I try to do, that's what I try to do with all of my peers in my art group as well. But I know that it's, um, it's, it's such an uphill fight because we don't actually have any support structure anymore. Mm -hmm. That's the one of the challenge challenges mm -hmm. that I keep hearing from all these talents, regardless of medium painters. You don't have any galleries unless you're left wing, you know, uh, there's a filmmaker. I know he, he looks for actors, uh, goes to these actors guilds and they're always suggesting him to make his script into an LGBTQ angle. Right. So, so it's just, it's all become so contaminated that we need people who are willing to, create an infrastructure in a direction to support these people because you are right. We need art to be put out in the forefront because it's so powerful because the power of art is not like, like you said, the power of bullets and material. The power of art is in its seduction. Right. It's seduction. Mm. And it's seduction that actually is much more powerful because yeah. this is why the idea that the pen is mightier than the sword is so true Amen. but the brush and the film all of this is mightier than the pen as well and we can literally create archetypes into people's minds you know and then they're set like i can you can think about like scenes from certain animated films when you watch with your kid or you watch as a child that you'll never forget but you will forget some statistic or some equation right 100 percent, because there's a story there's imagery there's aesthetics you don't forget that stuff we're innately connected to all this so we need artists producing art that promulgates the good, the true, and the beautiful. And I, w I remind everyone also, whenever you go to these left-wing institutions that are promoting their artists and their talent, remember, that is the compass. They don't know more than you. That's a pretentious facade. That's right. what they'd like, by the way. Right. They're, because they're not just um, debased. They're bad artists. They're, they're not bad. Very talented and at a all. A good work of art. And, and I, I just went over this recently. It, 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 St. Thomas Aquinas talks about how a good work of art is a triangulation. And every, it must be denoting the good, the true, and the beautiful. If it is missing one, it is incomplete. That's how I know it is good art. It needs to be formalistically strong and contextually strong. It can't, you can't make a work of art that's beautiful or, or like well done, I should say. But it's a subject matter that's dehumanizing. Right. Why, why would you want this? Why would you want this out in public? Why do you want your children to see this art? You know, but you also can't have a work that is beautiful in intention, but there's no sense of color theory proportions or real, there's no technique and skill. Right, no form. Then who cares? There's mm -hmm. nothing sexy about it. So you need both. And Aquinas is right in that regard. You need both. You need to make beautiful art that also has this deep sentiment in it. And then you might move people. You might influence people in the right direction. And... I've been doing that with my brush, but people can do that with photography. The medium isn't the point. You know, it's not the medium specificity isn't the point. It's the intention behind the medium. And it's about fighting all the degeneracy that's coming in from the other direction. And believe me, Elliot, we're outnumbered heavily because they also get support. We don't have awards. We don't have residencies. We don't have grants. We don't have any of that. You had to play towards them and then they would give them to you. But then what's the point at that point, right? Right. And, and that's the challenge. And that's why I am... You know, this might be announcing it early, but I also am in the process of potentially opening up a logic gallery hmm. to showcase different talent on our end. That is something that I'm considering doing as well. Um, but if in order to do it right, <laughs> I got a lot of work ahead of me if I'm to do that. So, but that's also another thing in the works but it's it's early i'm just doing excel sheets right now mm -hmm. well you <laughs> need funding you need financial yes. support yes this is a problem I, I mean i'll tell you right now that uh it's a strange dichotomy because capitalism is so important um because you know it's, it's the nature of the market and it allows people to flourish but capitalism is great for making money, but not necessarily for making culture. And this is the challenge that people see. Yeah, It's difficult to come to terms with this because on one hand, yes, I want everyone everyone on my side to have money. Of course. I love you all. You're on my team. You're on my tribe. We're all the same wolves. Love it. But it's difficult because the production of culture requires you to empty your pockets, so to speak. Yeah. But they don't understand. And this is the one thing the left actually understands that we don't yes. because we're pragmatic. The left understands an investment is not only based on the ROI in my bank account. An investment is also my hands actually influencing and dictating and supporting culture in a certain direction. 
That's something the left does understand, though. And I've seen that because I've gone to the Jane Hotel rooftop bar in New York where all the critics hang out. And I go to the Norwood Club where all the other talent and directors hang out. And like these are I'm, I'm, I'm giving away my secrets right now when I used to go there. Like I, these are the places you hang out at. And what do you see? You see a financial and political elite with talent congregating. That is brilliant. They're getting all the young people right there. That's brilliant. That is strategically speaking, that is brilliant. There's no reason we can't do that. And we're doing it in an honorable way because we're supporting artists to make beautiful work that is telling people to get closer to their family and stand up for what's right. right. Why can't we do that? But I it's think hard we for can't us. Do it. We can't do it if we do it in absence of the Lord. We can't do it if we do it in absence of God because they are pandering to and they are working through their God. And so when they see that the, That's true. the workings of the world uh, that their dollars are uh, supporting uh, support their spiritual agenda, i.e. Luciferianism, Satanism, um, then they have a higher calling for their uh, investment. Um, I don't think, and I, you know, I, putting this out as a question as well, what are your thoughts, that there's such thing as conservatism without Christianity. They, they, they're they they're one thing. Everything the conservatives are pushing, the traditionals are pushing, none of it matters if there's no God. Right. None of it matters. Like, like this is why when I see Jordan Peterson moving his hands like this and doing all this meta talk, I'm like, look, everything you're saying, as profound and articulate as it is, none of it matters if you don't believe in God. Right. It's, That's it, where it, the power it, it, will yeah, come from. Yes, 100%. So I agree, but we need to... We need to approach that without the Protestant Enlightenment streak because that is also going to... I'm already seeing infighting in the creative side, the talent, the, the artists who want to promote this type of art. There's already infighting there from... When, when we do get the funding or the type of people involved, there's this dinosaur Republicanish Protestant... Right. Where they don't want any edge. So in other words, they talk to me. I'll use me as an example. I'm a painter, right? They want me to paint the Statue of Liberty and bald eagles and red, white, and blue flags. Right. And, and a church in a grass field. You know why? Because they're one-dimensional in that regard. Right. We actually need to... That's fake conservatism. Yeah. We, I said this in a comment so on one of your videos, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. which was a great video, by, by the way, and you were talking about conservatives, um, Republicans. Yeah. And, and I said that true conservatism is Catholicism. <laughs> it, everything else is a fake conservatism Mega because base. that is the tradition of the West, whether we like it or not. And it's my belief that unless we, until we return to the tradition of the church and repair it, rather than being split, divided, and making up our own factions of it, you know, the the, the, the left is unified. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, the, they're so good. The conservatives are not only, you know, so you got some atheists and then you got the, the patriots and whatever, and then you got yeah, yeah. 47,000 different denominations. We really do need to come under one banner, and that is Christ's church. And, and, and there's a lot of one-upmanship there as well. There's right. one upmanship, like like there's certain figures who literally will, will like I've literally heard certain figures. I'm not going to name anyone who have helped younger talent get to a certain point, and then they're doing really well now. And they keep supporting them, and they say, "Hey, let me get on your show." No, there's like there's a lot of this petty high schooly thing mm -hmm. where I understand because they're being capitalists. See, it, it, it's it's right. and and that's their look, god. And here, yeah, exactly, rightfully so to a degree, but if you're not going to see the big picture, then you're a sellout. You know, and, and this is kind of where I'm at, where I see so many people who, you know, they talk about the culture, they do all this, but are you actually doing something to either problem with, like, like people should be either speaking up, making it known, or they should be at least patronizing and funding people who are in the cultural forefront, like you and I, like, because we're at least, we're, we're, we're putting ourselves in the front line. You know, I had Antifa shoot fireworks at me. You know what I mean? Like hmm. I've, I've dealt with these things and we can be targeted. You know, we, we, we look like we are the target for the enemy that they apparently hate, but they're just going to agree, clap on, then go right back into chugging along without anything actionable. You know, and, and this is kind of my concern. It's um, yeah, actions speak louder than words. And if you actually want to see something move and change in culture, you should be either speaking up or supporting people who are doing the speaking up for you. Like that's kind of where I'm at at this point, because otherwise 
you're just opening your lips, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Got a lot of that going on. Yeah. Tell me more about your, um, could I call it a guild? Or you're bringing mm. artists together that are of the same mindset and you guys are working together to promote each other's art. You're a mentor yes, to a lot of these yes, young yes. people. So I started an art collective called the Genesis Council. And I actually started this because when I was in New York City, I was always trying to find critiques so I can get feedback, get out of my echo chamber. I need, I need some other professional artists looking at my art. They were all just wine clubs to, to come together, drink red wine and talk about those bad conservative people. That's really what they ended up being. And I was, I joined three different groups in New York city and I was like, this is crap. Are we going to talk about art? And even when we did talk about art, it was never serious. Right. So I basically said, let me make my own painting collective uh, just so we can critique each other and we can support each other and we can give each other heads up about different things. And the first thing that happened is when I opened this guild up, Three writers asked if they can join because they heard my story as a fine artist dealing with cancel culture being targeted and and kicked out of the club essentially and ghosted by all the people that I work with. <laughs> and they said, we've dealt with the same thing as writers. Yeah. I said, well, you know what? I'll open it up to painters and writers. Then filmmaker wanted to join. Yeah. I go, okay, I'll open up to filmmakers. And, and then eventually I got to the point. I said, it's just a general art collective now where people who want to utilize their talent towards the good and 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 do and be righteous we'll all come together and we'll be the rebel alliance and this is basically the genesis council and when i eventually run this gallery which is going to take time it's going to be showcasing talent that's already been vetted through this group because because you know these people have all dealt with demons yeah yeah and so how can we send you money so there's two things. Um, I make my living with art. It's it's they're high ticket items because they are massive, gorgeous, and time consuming. So if you would like some beautiful art, you can go on my website and just simply contact me and tell me um, you're interested in putting a work on your walls. And I will say, often people think, you know, I can't afford any art. Well, you can. If you can't afford much, you can get something smaller and less complex. There's always something you can do. You know, so you can go on my shop as well and. If you just want to support my mission so I can continue speaking up in this manner and proliferating this message, you can go to my support section and make a monthly donation. Even five bucks, which is price of a coffee, that helps you. Anything you can do to help, it, it, it counts. So those are kind of my uh, channels you can help me with. And find me on Instagram. Awesome. And where can we find you on Instagram? Arthur Quan Lee. Nice. Yeah. Uh, and what about artists who are listening? Uh, of any bent, like you said, writers and filmmakers, um, is your guild open taking yes, applications? Yes, yeah, yeah. you, you, you can enter, but, you know, um, I always ask, you know, we don't want to be, we don't want to pigeonhole, right? So you got to be freedom of speech, right to bear arms in the family, recognize that, believe in God. Uh, those are just essentials, but uh, we don't expect everyone to come in as a complete product. The main point is your heart is in the right place. And we have people there who are just picking up and learning about the art game as well. And I'm happy to mentor them. Um, but yeah, we get together as well. And we always just, we get, we, we drink and have cigars too. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a fellowship. And um, yeah, what I will say though, if you are an artist listening, don't go to art school, you mm -hmm. know, um, make work that is undeniably strong and oriented towards God. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Arthur. This has been amazing, dude. Yeah, my what brother. What a great conversation. Appreciate you, man. Let's yes, sir. Yeah. We'll do it again. <laughs> Thank you for joining us, guys. This has been an amazing show, as I'm sure you agree. Come back next time, and uh, we'll continue rolling with these amazing Yo, Elliot, Elliot Holmes podcasts. See you then. Done. If you're a high-achieving businessman, executive, or entrepreneur who's dominating in business but struggle with drinking, drugs, overeating, or any filthy vice, Here's some advice. The biggest mistake that you could make is to try to quit cold turkey and use willpower to overcome your cravings. If you've ever quit for a few days or a few weeks only to self-sabotage by binging worse than before, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. Not only has my company helped thousands of men destroy vice and dominate life, I personally confronted and overcome the same struggles when I found myself hooked on weed at the peak of my business career. If you've got four minutes to listen to a coach who will help you achieve total self-mastery and control over your inner punk, 
then listen up. If you don't beat drinking, drugs, or any life-draining dependency in 90 days or less, not only will my company give you your money back, we'll pay for your first month's stay at a rehab retreat of your choice. That's what you need to succeed. So let's go, bro. Just visit waronvice.com, fill out an application, and my team will get back to you with the details. Hope to see you on the inside. Done.